Right, hello there folks. First of all, a thousand apologies for not posting a video last week. I've had a couple of weeks where everything's gone kind of hectic on me. From splitting the side of my Royal Enfield petrol tank, necessitating a new one, to all sorts of chaos. But anyway, here we are back again. And for this week, I thought I'd follow up on something I touched on briefly on my last video, the tour of my workshop. And that is a tool that most people consider to be top of their wish list for if you're a certain type of biker. Normally it's people with more exotic bikes or older British. I first got into these when I had a Yorul, because you're forever making little bits and pieces for them. Sports bikes owners, Jap sports bike owners, not so much because you literally buy the stuff throws off the shelf. But I'm of course talking about a lathe a means of turning metal to machine it and in my particular shed an object of either pure hatred of some or grudging respect from others the ubiquitous Chinese mini lathe as the name suggests these are produced in the far east for quite a low price when sent over here if you look on YouTube they are forever getting slammed, hammered, slagged off and all sorts. But are they really that bad? Well, the truth is, yes and also no. It depends who you are and what you're using them for. So here quickly is what I'm going to call the biker's guide to the Chinese mini lathe. Now, the first thing I'm going to say about this subject is as bikers and the uses we're going to put it lathe to absolute accuracy to thousandths of an inch might not be strictly necessary we're going to be doing modifying small parts maybe creating real spaces other kinds of spaces and i would argue that you've actually got a fair bit of slack in you know in your actual measurements when you're doing a real spacer because the idea is that you sort of the uh, swing arm would move slightly or the forks to actually join up so you've got a little bit of gap when you put it in a tiny tiny amount but that gap is taken up when you do up the nut so the, the thousandths of an inch accuracy that you might need for say scale model engineering isn't really needed as a biker and with that in mind these machines actually work out remarkably well first thing to think about if you're going to move on and buy any kind of lathe even a cheap Chinese mini lathe like this is you can, uh, if a machine costs 600 pound you should factor in at least another 200 pound at least for the tooling you're going to need because it's not going to come with tooling no lathe is unless you get a second hand one right once you've got your machine and unpacked it Let's go through this tooling quickly. The most useful thing you're going to use as a bike, and I use this all the time, is a drill bit which goes in what we call here the tailstock. Like that. If you've ever spent hours with a bench drill, something like that, trying to drill a hole down the centre of a piece of bar squarely, and you'll know, you should appreciate exactly what a godsend just this one little extra piece here is. Pretty much, put it in, put a bit of bio drilling in your chuck, and you're going to get, a, as long as you've got it set up right and you check the setting, you're going to get a square, uh, a squarely positioned hole, obviously not a square hole, straight down the centre of your bar, with no problems whatsoever. The normal fitment, what you get with these machines when they send them out to the factory, is what I call a centre there. You have a point on it, and normally your work, if you've got a long piece in there, you'd have a little, you'd put a little dimple in the end of it, which would fit in there. Now this is a solid piece of metal, so with high speed and a lot of work, there is a chance you could actually fractionally wear the end of it where the dimple is. So you can also buy for these what they call a moving centre, 
we have a start we have a shaft there stay still and the actual head is separate with the point which rotates and doesn't cause any wear. Now as you move along here, what I've got on this machine, and again amazingly cheap, though not sure is it's what they call a quick change steady. Or a quick change tool post, sorry. The standard tool post is one of these. You put your tool in the, in the gap there, bolt it down with bolts on the top, and off you go. The problems with these, of course, is that when you're machining a piece of metal in the lathe, you want to have your tool at the right working height to the bit of metal. Normally, it's just below or just above the centre line, or on the centre line itself. With one of these, the only way to achieve it with the standard tool post is to shim out the tool in the thing and muck around so you get the height right. And every time you obviously change the tool, you have to re-shim it. These tool posts here come with these little bits here. Now if you see that brass nut on the end, that just drops in and your height for the tool is already set. This obviously is a standard turning down tool here. You can take it in and out as often as you like and it will always go in at the right height to do your machining. Right, moving along as well. With a long piece of work as well, you might need, I'd recommend at least one kind of steady it's a piece, it's a thing that will go halfway and your piece of bar will go in the gap there, these are adjustable. Just to stop too much flex in the centre. Now, let's go through any common faults you might find with these. Obviously, they're not going to have the power of something like a, a large full size lathe. It's, this one here I think has got a 500 watt motor, which is not a huge amount when you look at some other electrical appliances. The, the gears in it, this is a spare set of gears here, underneath here are all plastic. Now, it's not as bad as it sounds, because as long as you treat the machine as it's meant to be treated, they won't give you any trouble at all. But, if you try to bite off too much of it, and you physically stop the machine cutting, where it literally can't cut and the whole machine judges unexpectedly to a halt, you can start stripping teeth on those. Right, moving round, round the back here, what you can't see, you've got a high and a low gear. So obviously, in the low gear you've got more torque, but less speed. And in the high gear you've got more speed, but less torque. Right, having said that, that brings us round to the one big advantage of these machines over a conventional lathe. On a conventional lathe to change speed, just like a bench drill normally, you have to open the top and move rubber belts in between drive wheels to get to. On this, it's by an electric motor. So, if you watch the speed there, I'll turn it on now. Notice there's a bit of material in the, in the actual chuck. I'm not gonna do anything with that, but any lathe, they do recommend not spinning it up with an empty chuck. Right, so there you can see it's running on 382, 385 roughly RPM. This is in high gear at the moment. And it will spin all the way up to just over 2,500 RPM. But simply by turning a switch, you can alter your cutting speed on the job. Taking it right down. So you there we're moving at about just under 20 RPM. Obviously that's too slow to do any kind of practical work. But it kind of gives you the idea of how you can adjust the speed on these. You've got left and right on the front here, obviously. This at the moment is spinning to the left because your cutting tool is coming in from this side. So you'll be cutting this side. 
sometimes it's advant advantageous to have it spinning the other way because then you could uh, if you're boring out a hole in the center if you're cutting a left hand thread all sorts you can change the direction this rotates in my issues with these machines if there's one big issue you're going to have with these is that you can't really see it there not on that one but you get a lot of backlash on some of these there you go you can see it there okay backlash on these gearings now there's loads of tutorials on eBay where you can adjust a lot of that out but it's still going to be there to the degree which is what makes these machines so hard to work with if you're doing real precision engineering also there's some debate amongst people that how's the accuracy of these dials here but again if you're just turning out wheel spindles and bits and pieces for your bikes that shouldn't be a problem the only advice I'll give you keep your vernier handy and check with a vernier on a regular basis you're looking at small cuts regular checks now materials you can use in this let's start at the top titanium obviously is a complete and utter no-no there's not any chance this machine will cut titanium really to be quite honest you're running on down stainless steel if you're using extremely shallow cuts I mean really shallow and you're willing to take a long time this will work stainless steel but with only a 500 watt motor it won't last that long probably best if you're going to work with stainless steel to get a more serious machine to be perfectly honest however by the time you get down to mild steel mild steel again with shallow cuts is well within this machine's capabilities so funny enough I don't often work with mild I'm not a great fan of it to be quite honest the material I prefer to work with if we want something fairly hard but easy to machine is brass no problems at all and perfect for wheel spacers anything you might need to make it's perfect so, so you, you can work with mild steel you can work with brass with brass though, the only advice I'd give you more than anything else wear proper fully covered eye protection not just a pair of like spectacle brass all materials the swarf comes off in different ways with stainless steel you get a very long ribbon coming off which is basically like a razor blade if you're going to try if you're running a machine with stainless steel and you want to clean that off do not ever put your hands anywhere near it it'll cut you use an old piece of wood or a piece of metal to just to knock the swarf out of the way a mild steel will come off in like chips basically so you get like little bits just chipping off and but brass will come off in small thin needles now the number of times doing engineering I've seen bits of those There's, they're probably less than the thickness of a human hair but if you get one in your eye you can't it won't even come out with washing your eye out it's a trip to the health center and every time I've seen it the only thing everyone agrees on is that it bloody hurts so if you're gonna work with brass full eye protection chaps obviously softer materials engineering plastics aluminium not a problem with this machine at all so the end of the day thoughts if you're a biker if you're happy to work in mild steel brass or softer materials you're making things like real spaces for your bike that sort of thing this machine is absolutely perfect and will do what you want it to do but if you have got any kind of aspirations towards doing more serious engineering or more accurate engineering then I would possibly recommend either second hand or brand new a more serious lathe but if you're umming and ahhing you know do I want to do this if you can afford it it's always a good addition to a workshop I recently had to fix a friend's 125 who dropped it quite heavily and on the bottom yoke it actually bent the lock stock for the steering so much that to try and bend it straight even with heat 
would have been like dangerous. So what I did was I decided I needed a bolt with a large head and a small thread, smallish thread. And the idea being to drill a hole in what was left of the old lock stock, lock stop, tap it and feed this in, then you had basically an adjustable lock stop for handlebars. But obviously, as kind of a specialist, so I uh, couldn't find a bolt like that straight anywhere. So I took a larger bolt with a large head, put it in the chuck, turned down the threaded section to the diameter I wanted, and then tapped it up for the new thread. Incidentally, another thing, let's turn this off for safety before I show you this. Another thing you can quite happily do, if you've got to do tapping, something like that, a danger it always is in starting it right so it doesn't go off skew if you can quite happily hold your piece of work in the chuck here that you're going to tap fix your tail stop tail stop chuck in there put your tap in that bring it slide it up introduce it into the hole and then by turning by hand don't ever don't use a power one of these leaves you might well bugger it up yeah by turning by hand like that then feeding the tap in with the other hand you're guaranteed it's going to go in square and tap square right from the get-go you don't always need to use a power on one of these to get a good result on the job so there you go the ubiquitous chinese mini lathe if you're doing jobs on your bike go for it so if you want to start building model steam engines, look out for a second hand Myford, something similar. Anyway, that's it for today. If in the next week I need to do a tyre change on the front of the Enfield. It's a tube tyre obviously, so what I'll do is hopefully I might put out another video soon detailing uh, tube and tyre changes on old style bikes. But until then, take care. Ride safely and just have fun out there. Bye.